Ted Savelle. Nathaniel Jones. Sam Sealy. I don't have the permit. <laughs> <laughs> So, Sarah, are you in Zoom? Yes, yes. No, are, I'm not. Can, can you join the Zoom so I can make you a co host? Okay. Yeah. Almost ready, Lindsay. Yeah, no worries. Hi, um, Dean. This is Alaire. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Alaire. Uh, awesome. Um, so I'm out in the field today. I'm driving, and I'm about to get to the, the site. We're doing a dam removal down in Southern Vermont, so I'm not going to be able to be on most of the call. Um, but I just I didn't want to just call since I'm I'm available. At like right now, so just let you guys know. Okay, thanks. I, I don't think we'll need you for quorum, so but I appreciate. Okay, I'll, I'll just hang and listen while I can, but then I'm gonna. It's probably in about fifteen minutes or so. I'm gonna have to drop off. Okay, thanks for the heads up. Yeah, sorry about that. All right, I think, Dean, I don't want to jump the gun, but I feel like we could maybe start introductions. Yes, we certainly can do that because we are well in forum land. Okay. So. Great. Um, so let me see if I can just see folks. Um, I guess actually, Dean, not to throw you into too many things, but maybe start with the in-person folks, because that I can't call on. I'm not sure who's here. Sure. So, Dan, why don't you, we'll just go around the horn here. So why don't we start with you? Okay, I'm Dan Seeley from representing Richford. Yeah, Pete Benevento from Lake Carmine. Hi, I'm Sarah Grass. I'm Eco, uh, Eco America member at NRCC. Tucker Malone from Land Trust and OER is also next. Down, Ted Savelle, Orleans County, NRCB. And I'm Nathaniel Johns. I'm the Clean Water Program Manager for BHCB. Um, we're the clip for men for Magog. So I've been meaning to attend one of these meetings for a while and just kind of decided at the last minute to come to this one. So happy to be here and meet all of you. Um, and Lindsay, before I hand things over to you, uh, I think most of you know who I am. I'm Dean Pierce with the Regional Planning Commission and I'll run the quiz. Great. Well, thanks to the folks that are in person. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to join you there. And Dean, I'm not sure if there's a way to not blur your background, but it, it oh. it's, it's a little weird. We're just seeing you. <laughs> um, so these sort of blurry voices from the background. Uh, I am kick off the Zoom intros. I'm I am the uh, chair of the BWIC. I'm I'm Lindsay White, the director of the Mississauga River Basin Association, and I'll just call on the Zoom folks to make it go a little quicker. Oh, thanks, Dean. That's a better view. Great. Uh, Peter, go ahead and intro yourself. Peter Zamore. Yes, uh, Peter Zamore. I'm a representative from South Hero on the Northwest Regional Planning Commission and the incoming chair of the board. 
Um, and I will be turning off my audio and video, but we'll be listening for the remainder of the meeting. Great. Lauren. Now, Lauren Weston, I'm the district manager for Franklin County Natural Resources Conservation District. Also apologize that I will not be there first today. I use she her pronouns. Barry. Good morning, everyone. Barry Lamke, uh, Northwest Regional Planning Commission. Uh, pronouns are he, him. And I'm, I'm actually eating, so I'm going to turn off my camera for the very first part of the meeting. Jim. We got Jim. We just is AI. Bridget. I'm working on getting my video on. There we go. Hi, everybody. This is Bridget Butler. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Friends of Northern Lake Champlain um, and the alternate for uh, watershed works. Dave. I'm trying. There we go. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm Dave Allerton, Public Works Director in the Town of St. Albans. I'm an alternate on the committee. Great. I think that's everyone. Did I miss anyone? Is Sarah's in person and Zoom? I think that's. that's yeah, all. She, yeah, oh, Beth. In case I drop off for some reason. Right. Uh, Beth did. I think Beth just popped in. Beth, are you able to do a quick intro of yourself? Beth, are you there? We're doing intros. Okay. Well, um, again, thanks everybody for being there. Um, it's <laughs> it's good to see some new faces, and uh, it's a little. It'll be our first hybrid. A little weird. Mostly, I feel like I'm missing out, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to be multiple places in a short time span of a day. Uh, meeting protocols. Uh, Dean, I don't know if you wanna share that screen for our typical protocols. Um, because this is a uh, hybrid, it's a little bit different, but you know, please be respectful, please stay focused. Uh, if you're via Zoom and you're able to keep your camera on, uh, you know, it was great to hear folks say, I'm gonna be eating, I'm doing this, but you know, just, we want to make sure that folks are staying engaged, um, especially this annual meeting where we'll we'll have some, not that we don't always have important things to discuss, but, uh, and then for folks that are Zooming in, just be aware of uh, environmental noise. We want to make sure that we can all participate. So um, put yourself on mute if there's going to be background noise or if you're not actively engaged uh, in the conversation. Uh, let's see if I can get back. Scroll back up to my agenda and make sure I'm staying on top of things. Uh, any conflict of interest declarations today? Hearing none, we'll move on to reviewing and adjusting um, uh, and approving the agenda, making any adjustments if folks have any to add. Also hearing none, let's move right on to approving the minutes. Uh, just with our, Dean noted this in the meeting packet, but thanks Sarah for keeping us on track all this year and we will certainly miss you. Um, I hope that uh, your service year has been a, a good one and we appreciate everything you've done for us uh, as partners, but also as as the BWIC certainly. Thank you. Folks got a chance to look through the minutes um, with that meeting packet. So um, we'll just seek a, a motion to approve unless there, are, unless there are comments on it or corrections that folks want to make. Believe that was a motion from Dan. Is there a second? Second. 
Great, Sarah, thanks. <laughs> Sarah Down seconded. Uh, all in favor of approving these minutes from our last meeting? Yeah, you can indicate with hand raised. Okay, so uh, I, Dean, you're gonna have to read the ones in the in the physical room, but on the screen, I I see uh, Lauren, Lindsay, Beth, Barry. Uh, we have, sorry, we have Dan and Sarah here in the room. Okay. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none. Hearing none. We will approve the minutes. Uh, public comment. Speak now. Anything folks want to bring up that's not related to things that we'll be discussing further in the agenda? Okay, we're just flying through things. Um, budget adjustment. This is, Dean did note in the meeting packet that there is a budget adjustment. Yes, um, there isn't really much more to say beyond what was included in the packet and what I'm hoping people can see on the slide that's on the screen. Um, just to recap though, some time ago, the council adopted a policy that allows for budget adjustments to be made for approved projects. Um, that policy has a series of, of steps or levels or tiers and for small requests that are uh, up to 10% of a budget that can be approved administratively. That's by, by WISP staff, that's me. Um, if it's between 10 and 20%, it goes to the chair and vice chair. Uh, and if it's larger than that, it goes to the whole council. And there was one administratively approved uh, request under the policy. What happens is after the first meeting after the adjustment is approved, the council has to be notified. So that's what this is. It's a notification, it's not an action, um, but it's for informational purposes. And it's a way for you folks to gauge um, how many times the policy is being used and how it's being used. Are there any questions? Sorry, Dean, I was just gonna say, thanks for approving this. Um, I just wanna to note to everyone, this was a project development grant for five projects and four of them moved forward, which was awesome. And it just ended up taking a lot more time than originally anticipated. Um, and we actually, we spent well more than 10% over the, the budget, um, but getting the additional 10% was very useful. So thank you. And if I may, Lindsay, as a, as a follow-up to that, we're, we are the RPC are thinking about things like deadlines because one of the I think maybe I'm I'm assuming too much if there was more time it might have been uh, a larger request for a budget adjustment but that would have just meant more organizing and and wrangling and and the regional planning commission was looking at a deadline for getting its invoicing into the state so. Um, Yes, it, it could have been a larger request and maybe one way to address this in the future is we just have to start the the billing process a little earlier so that we build in more time for things like requests to adjust budgets. But I was happy Dean, to, as I could. Dean, that was very kind. The lateness was on my part. I just want to be very clear. It was It was my fault. <laughs> So if there are no more questions, and I'll share. Great. Next up, um, organizational task, membership renewals and appointments and seating of alternates. Uh, Dean, I'm going to let you inform. I'm going to take things from here. I'm going to try to make the slides visible both to you and the people in the room here. <laughs> right. I can fully 
And um, uh, apologies to you folks in the room because I'm going to have to look at this. I'm not able to see it on the screen as well. Um, so this agenda item is before you as a result of language that is in a guidance document that the Department of Environmental Conservation approved after the Basin Council was created. So as many of you know, there was a law and then there, there was a rule that implements the law that creates the councils and the, and the quists. But there was also something called the guidance document that has 10 chapters in it that extends the policies that govern the work that we do. And in one of those chapters, DEC um, decided that each basin council every two years should, should essentially go through a um, re-establishment process. And so that's why we're doing this. It wasn't something that we knew when we started. When we started, we understood that uh, under the rule, it was necessary to elect a chair and vice chair at the annual meeting, but we didn't say that there had to be any kind of annual or every two years uh, recreation, but that's effectively what DEC is asking the councils to do. So that's what we're doing. And it's, it's why I reached out to many of you a couple of months ago to say, are you still interested in serving? And if you weren't, um, if people weren't, and it's less of an issue in this basin than it was in the Lamoille basin, um, we needed to work on getting replacements and, and um, alternates. Sometimes in, in uh, the Lamoille Basin, at least, someone who was an alternate became a rep. But we're doing this because the guidance document says that we need to do it. And um, so that's why we're here. Um, we're following the EC guidelines. We're renewing members. And you could ask yourself, well, why is this happening? Well, one answer to that question is, is that it's it's meant to help ensure that we continue to have diverse representative council to guide the work. Uh, the law and the rules say that the members of the council are nine people from four sectors, municipalities, regional planning commissions, watershed organizations, uh, natural resource conservation districts, uh, and I'm sorry, five sectors and land conservation organizations. So we we have a a focus. Yeah, the people represent sectors, but we want to try to ensure diversity. Um, there is some. Just I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent. There is some possibility that the rule mentions for adding members, but then the voting gets very very complicated, and that's perhaps a conversation for another day. And like I was just saying, conservation districts, RPCs, watershed protection organizations, land conservation organizations, municipalities. Um, one of the bullet points that you can see talks about how each category can have alternates and there can be multiple alternates. And that's one of the things that I have been emphasizing more recently. And that is to try to have as many alternates as we can for each spot because that just provides greater flexibility. One reason to have alternates is so that if an organization has an application before the council, they cannot vote on it. So then that would mean their alternate can vote on it, which would mean that, okay, we don't want the same organization to be the alternate because they would have to recuse themselves too. But if we have different organizations or if we have multiple organizations, then we avoid that problem. We would we would not, in a sense, disenfranchise a sector when an applicant has to recuse themselves from the vote. Um, and so anyway, we're going to see a table. You've seen this table in your packet. It's showing who is here. And it's essentially just a... Um, this is the makeup for now. People can uh, change their positions mid-course, but we are doing this today to establish with DC that we've 
all of the guidance and the council has been reconstituted. We'll send this to DEC uh, and we will also continue to work on getting people added to the list of alternates, because as you can see, the RPC roles currently have no alternates and one of the municipal roles doesn't. There was uh, a, an alternate for Dan who has decided that he can't invest the time. So that's that's what we're doing. And like I say, it's it's a little bit um, a little bit ambiguous in that no one's making a motion that you declare yourselves the representatives, but um, this is the, the the team for the upcoming couple of years, barring uh, people stepping down or people joining. And as many of you know, when someone has, has someone has been identified who would like to be an alternate, then they get seated at a meeting, it's essentially a recognition of them and they are added to this part. Are there any questions that anybody has? Because if not, then we can move on to what is the customary main item for the annual meeting, which is the election of the chair and vice chair. Are you good with that, Lindsay? Yeah, I think we can move on. I will continue to, to move us along um, by sharing this slide that the uh, basic information was included in the meeting packet. Um, elections for the chair and the vice chair are happening today. And this is something that the bylaws say, as well as the rule, or the bylaws say them because of the Act 76 rule. Our bylaws say that a month before this meeting, you could decide to create a nominating committee or not. And the decision was made not to create a nominating committee, which means that the election of the chair and the vice chair will take place after nominations are made from the floor. Uh, and if it's okay, Lindsay, since uh, I, I don't know if you are... Um, going to be nominated to serve as chair, but I suspect that may be the case. And since you may not want to run a meeting that you're nominated to be the chair of, then I will handle things until that election is over. That's okay. Sounds good. Okay. Are there any nominations for the chair of the Nisiskloy Basin Water Quality Council uh, for the coming year? So that's Dan, who would like to nominate Lindsay. Lindsay, can you just confirm for the body that you are um, willing to to accept that nomination and if elected, serve? I I confirm, although um, I feel like I haven't necessarily filled the shoes that Lauren left me for me as well as uh, as could be. So I wouldn't be offended if someone else wanted to step forward. But I'm happy to continue muddling through if nobody wants this role. Understood. Are there any other nominations for the position of chair of the Basin Council? Going once, going twice, gone. Um, I, would, uh, I would accept the motion to close nominations. Sarah is moving that we close nominations. I second. Okay. Thank you, Ted. So Ted is second. Um, all in favor of closing nominations? Okay. So we have Dan, Sarah, and Ted on this end. And perhaps others can say their name if they are voting to close nomination. Please. Yeah, I think if folks want to indicate, folks via Zoom indicate um, by hand or whatever, I can just call. Okay, I see Lindsay, Lauren, Beth, Barry. Okay, that's going to cover us. So with the nominations closed, I would uh, now call for the vote 
on the nomination, all in favor of electing Lindsay the chair of the council or re-electing Lindsay the chair of the council, please uh, indicate. And those here, so we have Dan, Tucker, Sarah, and Ted, and online we have Beth and Barry and Lauren and... I'll recuse myself. Okay, she's recusing herself. Okay. Um, and, and just for information purposes, Bridget, you are the counting, you are, since, um, yeah, you are serving in a voting role today because I don't see Kent here. Kent's not, Kent's not there. <laughs> uh, he said that he might show up in person, but, um, he is not here. I know I got an email from him that gave me more hope that he would be here in person than I thought. So okay. if you would like to vote, you are able to vote. Would you like to vote on uh, in favor or not? I just want to make sure that I can- Of closing the-, of closing the... <laughs> uh, Sorry, this is my first time voting, so now I'm really confused. Okay. Yeah, would, if you are a vote in favor of electing Lindsay as the chair, you can say aye and add your voice oh. to those. I let's go, Lindsay. Thanks for clarifying, Dean. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, uh, any opposed? The ayes have it. And so, Lindsay, you are once again the chair, and you can carry on with the election of the vice chair. All right. Uh, we'll accept nominations for vice chair. Uh, currently, we're Kent and so <laughs> as, as served as our vice chair for the last year. Are there any nominations for vice chair? Oh, why not keep the ticket the same? I didn't nominate Kent. <laughs> All right, we've got Ted nominating Kent to retain vice chair position. Any other nominations? And I can confirm uh, that I got an email from Kent indicating his willingness. Thank so you. That's, that's an, yeah, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> there are no other nominations. I'll seek a motion to close the floor for nominations. <laughs> That's, I think that was a Dan motioning and, and Ted seconding to close nominations for vice chair. So we will now seek votes for accepting um, Kent as vice chair for another round of WIC year. All in favor, please indicate either in the room and maybe Dean, you can indicate that for the record and I'll just call on the ones I see on screen. I've got Lindsay, Lauren, Bridget, Barry and Beth. And here he comes in the yeah. bar. Oh, nice. Man of the hour. <laughs> we're, we're just yeah. voting on you as vice chair. Oh, did I get flush? <laughs> it's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, congratulations are in order to Ken. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good time. Right back to you, Dean, the uh, uh, project development funding proposal. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, again, sorry for turning my back to you folks here. This agenda item uh, continues the conversation that we started at the last meeting. Um, at the last meeting, you'll remember there was discussion about the the push DBC is making for twists and wicks to find ways to expand or increase the amount of project development funding that flows to partner organizations. And we didn't come to any conclusions then, but um, people understood that this is, this is something that uh, is out there in the works. 
there is going to be a specific proposal that we will discuss, and I apologize in advance because it's kind of dense, but the idea for it was initially inspired by what was done in the Northern Lake Champlain Basin, that's Basin 5. They started a couple of meetings ago. At one meeting, they adopted a particular motion, and then at their next meeting, they adopted a second motion, but the overall approach is something that we are doing, but we are also extending. The Lamoille Basin Council, which met a couple of weeks ago, saw the same proposal, and I will tell you that they did adopt that proposal. So that's that's where this is coming from. Last time, you know, we, we went over a bunch of different points. These are some of them. Project development is a category of project that has been eligible for funding from the beginning of this project. DEC is, is pushing for expanded funding. They see opportunities. It's, um, it is not necessarily the solution to everyone's problems, but we're going to at least take a step because we think it will help at least to some degree. There are, um, there are documents, <clears throat> excuse me, that try to clarify what you can spend project development money on. And there are lots of lines and some of the lines are fuzzy is how I had it put. Um, but anyway, we're hopeful that we can do something good that will make money available to partner organizations more easily so that you can do your work. We were not sure that we would come up with a definitive proposal, but um, we have. And so that's what is in front of you and that we will talk about. Um, but the broad outlines of what we're trying to do is to create a system. And under that system, basically a partner organization, if they're pre-qualified, and, and I won't go into what pre-qualification is, but it's a, it's a it's a process to just basically say, yes, we're in the game. But the idea is we're setting aside $100,000 for 10 organizations. And the goal is to have a simplified or expedited process to get money for at least some type of work, one particular type, project development. And we thought that the best way to present it to the council would be to have two motions. And I'm gonna walk through the motions, but I will also say that in the Lamoille Basin, they went big and they had a single motion that, that included everything. And I'm not necessarily saying that that's what you should do, but that's what they did. But the, the steps that are envisioned are that would authorize the creation of a project development program and that what you're doing is pre-approving projects for each potential recipient. So the normal course of events is an application comes in during a funding round, it's packaged, it's compiled along with the other applications and it comes before you and you vote on it. Now there has to be a lot of stuff done to get the application ready. You have to have project development or project ID numbers and all of that stuff. We're looking to have it reversed, at least for this category of funds. So we want Basin Council to consider saying, we're gonna just pre-approve some things and that will make it simpler for the partner organizations to get funding flowing. So if you were to do that, then the quiz would open up a, an application process um, with the partners and say, okay, do you want to get in line if the, if the WIC has approved this? And then if they say yes and not, there's no obligation on the part of the groups to apply for this, it doesn't affect applying for anything else. They could get this money and apply for other things. It's just an option. It's an opportunity. But if, if partner organizations do apply, then we would just process the application and do whatever it is that we need to do. And we would sign 
a task award, which is basically the vehicle for getting the money so that the partners can be reimbursed. So that's a graphical representation of what we're trying to do. I'm going to stop for a second and maybe to see, are there any questions so far? Yes, sir. If the, yes, sir. So you individually would make those decisions then? Or so the council is making the decision to try to make it easier um, for partner organizations. So it's it's essentially like you're approving a menu and, and saying to the partner organizations, if you apply for something on the menu, then here's your approval. Okay, so you're not making that decision. No, I can't I can't do anything unless the Basin Council authorizes it. And so isn't it? So what we're thinking and what Basin Five and Basin Seven have thought is that it's just one thing that's out of the way. <laughs> and furthermore, it's an even simpler application process. So the current system that we have has an application form, you start filling it out. And if you're doing a project development application, it's a slightly shorter application form, but if it's a different kind, then it's a longer one. The idea for this is that it would be an even simpler form. And the goal for it is to get the paperwork out of the way, yeah. okay. essentially. Thank you. So as I was saying, the um, the approach that we came up with was a couple of motions, and I'm gonna um, burden you with basically scanning through the wording of the motion, um, and then just referring you to the comments that you should be able to see off to the side. Um, and I'll just try to abbreviate it, but if a motion like this is adopted, then it could lead to the second motion. And if that one is adopted, then we feel like we have we have the program's approval under the terms of the motion and we can get it going, we can get it underway. So like most motions, it starts with, I move that the WIC approve obligation. And I apologize, that's a mistake because this there's more funding in the Missisquoi than in Lamoille, and I will admit to having cut and pasted. So it's really a hundred thousand dollars. So the records show it's a hundred thousand divided by ten. So that's ten thousand per. So obligation about the hundred thousand in WIC formula funds. Put that in context. In one year of funds for the Missisquoi, about a million and a half dollars are available for doing projects of all stages. So it's a pretty small portion of the total amount that's available. So I move that the book approved obligation of up to $100,000, and, and that says, wait, I don't know where my brain was, it's phase in six, mm -hmm. for the purposes of establishing a general project development program. So we're creating a program, phase in six, Project solicitation processes are hereby amended to include this on an ongoing basis. Is basically what that's saying. Why, why am I suggesting that the motion say something like that? It's because there's some language in this guidance that I talked about, and I want you to be protected because if you think this is a good idea, I don't want anybody to say, oh, well, they're it's flawed because they it's not in their normal process. And I'm suggesting through this wording that you are hereby declaring or would be declaring that this is now part of your system. Okay, that's what that's all about. That's the first paragraph, Q, second paragraph. And as part of this program, so $100,000, $10,000 each, this is part of the regular program. As part of this program, new task awards would be issued to the pre-qualified partners for project development initiatives consistent with DEC requirements. And that's clarified by the motion following this one. So we'll get to that, but we can preview it. But it's essentially saying we'll follow the steps. It'll be a task award. That's what we normally do. It's the pre-qualified partners. 
We know who they are. It's for project development work. We know what that is. And we, we are saving that for the record. And so here's something that's more discussion briefly or explication briefly. We have nine pre-qualified entities whose territory is primarily in the Mississippi Basin. We have some like the town of Fairfax where it's a teeny tiny portion. And so I'm not including them in this. It's where their primary territory is in our basin. They're all eligible for QUIS funds, for approved QUIS funds. The Regional Planning Commission is also eligible for QUIS funds. So you may recall that a year or so ago, the Regional Planning Commission actually made an application for a project and it was approved. So the Regional Planning Commission can also be like a pre-qualified partner and can do projects and does do projects. And I'm suggesting, this is what this approach is suggesting, this is that for the purposes of this program, the Regional Planning Commission would be like a partner. So that's what that last line is saying, is that it's pre-qualified partners and the Regional Planning Commission. The reason why I don't just say pre-qualified partners is because as odd as it seems, the Regional Planning Commission isn't a pre-qualified partner. Okay. Phew, again. Closing, closing stretch here. And so the motion maker is also saying that upon adoption of this motion, this staff, so you as a WIC would be directing me to say that I would solicit project development requests using a simple application form, pursue one or more watershed project database ID numbers to facilitate the award process, and the quiz would be authorized to award funds in an amount of up to $10,000 annually for each recipient. So again, apologies, 10,000, not 5,000. So it's, it's giving direction. You're saying that, hey, we like the idea of this program. We're gonna follow the process of task awards that can go to the partners. And that if it gets approved, guess what, Green? You're going to do a solicitation and you're going to pursue project ID numbers. And I'm going to talk about that. And that the quiz is authorized to award the funds. Now, the second, the middle bullet of that last paragraph pursue one or more watershed project database ID numbers. One of the things that some people, organizations have experienced is challenges with getting watershed ID numbers. Mm -hmm. Anything, any funds that we use as part of this process have to have an ID number. And there are some people who think, myself included, that maybe, just maybe, what we can do is get project ID numbers in advance that are somewhat generic that will save a partner organization from having to get one. And I think people are going to be able to follow that. Now, Wait a minute. who is going to do that? Well, so this, is, who is going to do so this is this is saying that the WIC wants the quiz or, or me to at least try to get a generic ID number because we and, and people who do what I do and what Nathaniel do aren't necessarily sure that it's gonna be possible, but Dan and I have talked about this and we, we would love to be able to go to Karen Bates with a, a proposal or a proposed ID number that is generic that we can then match parties to. So that if you were to come in, I'd say, oh, Ken, you don't have to get a number for a new project development work. I've already got one that you can use part of. So that's the hope. And it says pursue. It doesn't see, it doesn't say get, because as of now, there are no guarantees we will be successful, but we're committed to trying. And whether or not we'll we will succeed remains to be seen. 
Karen Bates was at the Lamoille meeting and she made some comments and she's on vacation or out of state this, this week. So she's not part of this meeting. And she, if she were, she would probably comment some on it. Um, but there's going to be some tension around the idea of getting these numbers pre-approved. Now, I believe because there's a there's a type of project that's called project development block grant that exists, which I think should mean that we can we can do what well, this is what we're trying to do, but it remains to be seen whether or not they will approve that. But that's what the second bullet is. It's saying that we will pursue getting numbers so that a partner organization wouldn't have to. Now that doesn't mean that a partner organization couldn't. We're not trying to say to the partner organization, we don't think you're smart enough. It's nothing like that. It's just this goal that we would like it to be easier for the partner organization. Because if they know that they're entitled to get up to $10,000 and that they know that if we have three or four or five pre-approved pre ID numbers that they could be assigned one of, um, it'll just simplify things. Okay, so you think that this can be approved at the tactical basin planner level, or does this have to get kicked up to Rottler and Cayman and eventually the secretary? How, how high does this decision have to go? Well, so right now, the the person who signs off on the ID numbers is the basin planner. Right. Yeah, so, so we're not... Um, I realize that, but I'm wondering about the oversight for the quiz, and that's not that's not Kevin. That goes further up. That goes further up the ladder. When you say the oversight for the quiz, I'm not sure what you mean. Like what part of this? Well, I'm I'm really I'm really confused that if, if this can actually fall under Karen's. If, if 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 we go down this, we go down this line. What's the key? Chris Rotwick from or Neil from coming back and saying, no, that's not how the rules are in Act 76. That's not how we've laid this out. I mean, how far are we really going to get with this? I agree. I think this is really important. Yeah. I've said that, you know, for the last three or four years that this project identification has not received the attention that it should have it should have gotten in the original. When uh, when the formulation grants when that menu was made, and I and I I really I really support what you're doing here, but I'm just trying to look at the roadblocks. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, and I do a lot of that too, and I am appreciative of the question. <clears throat> and the thing that I would say is that we're our our quisp, and I know at least one other, the staff are going to try to see if we can get numbers in advance. And, and it may be that it, we're just gonna struggle and struggle and, and not get any success, but that still won't keep this process, this program from working because there's, there's always gonna be the normal process, which is to, to go to Karen with a, a proposal. Now, another quick aside, we're, um, you know, I've, I've dug into this, enough where I've created a thing that's online that's not ready for prime time yet, but it's um, it's a way to try to make it even easier for someone to come up with the language that Karen will approve. So basically it just, it's a form that people start filling out and they choose from some, some menu options and then it spits out something at the end that hopefully will Karen will approve. And so even if we don't get Karen to say yes to something that might be called generic, we'll still be helping the partners with getting the ID numbers. We're still, That's part of what makes this work. Okay. That's kind well, of, wait, can I finish? Yeah. This is really important because it's a real challenge for, for our organizations to work with our project managers in order to get this done. And there aren't very many of us. I mean, nine pre-qualified members, that's not a very high number. It's, it's really, really important that we keep this as simple as possible because so many of our projects right now are just being held up, you know, because of, because of, because of overcomplication. 
Yeah. So, and so there's no guarantee that we'll come up with generic numbers in advance, but we think it's worth trying. And so this is this is in the motion. It didn't have to be in the motion, but it's in the motion to, I guess, like as a measure of good faith, that we're committed to this idea and we want to make it we want to make it possible because it's going to be a half measure if we create this and it still gets bogged down in the getting the project ID number part. We don't want that. This pro this program would work more effectively if there are already on the menu ID numbers that you can use that we can hand out. So that's that's the goal, but it's not a guarantee, but that's the goal. And if it doesn't work, you know, and it's also, you know, maybe someday I've said from almost the beginning of my tenure that either ID numbers should not be required for certain types of work. And that maybe would be project development, or that the QIFs should have the authority to assign numbers. And that policy change hasn't gotten any traction, but you know, I can dream. But maybe in the next version of the funding policy it would say that, or maybe more likely it would clarify this idea that when it comes to project development work, if DEC says, you know, do project development, do project development, get the money in the partner's hands. Well, then say what you mean, mean what you say. Have the funding policy say that in each basin, there can be some number of generic IDs that can automatically be used in conjunction with a funding OLA like this. So that's a lot to unpack because there's a lot of problems with the watershed database number as you move out of project development. But sticking strictly with project development, basically, if I put in an application for project development funds through this, and you give me a menu and I can select that, you go get the number. I don't see a problem with that because that's what we all do anyways. When we have a project development, we're picking a place on the map, we're going after it, we get a number, we kind of tell Karen or Ben roughly what the parameters we're looking at. That number. that number then becomes the parent number. And then as we move out of project development into design and through to implementation, we have to continue to get new numbers. We can't keep that same number. So now we're getting lost. And project development can take on so many faucets. You can get to 30% design within a project development. Well, like that's loose, I mean, that's you can get the concepts down. If the project's small enough, you could skip some of that. Because I've talked to Stacy and Ben and others in DC, like Shannon. If the project's small enough, skip the thirty percent, get a hundred, and go straight to implementation. Like bundle that all together because it's going to reduce the time frame from two years to less than a year to get a project done. For example, I have a burn that I'm trying to remove. I had Shannon and Stacy sitting there, yeah, great. We love your concept, just move this forward. Now I'm hitting the Karen roadblock where now every step of the way needs a new number. Well, so <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So so we're not we're not gonna we're trying to be focused. Yes, there's there are a lot more things that we can try to do, but I would say try to do it on another day. This was, this is, a, this is aimed at responding to this push DEC has made to get more project development funds in the hands of partner partner organizations, and we want to do it more readily. Now, the things that you just pointed out are bigger problems, and and we're not going to try to address them today. The idea that you're you're supposed to get, you know. That this DEC system says you get a new project number for each step. That's that's the that's the current paradigm. We're not trying to change that paradigm today. That doesn't mean that it wouldn't be something that we can talk about. And I will just say very quickly that I in my other basin, the Momoyal Basin, I know there was a project that did skip a step where as part of preliminary design, they got essentially 90% and they did get a, a implementation number. And so I know that that's possible, but that's that's a 
that's bigger. That's beyond what we're trying to sure. do today. So what you're really getting at is just that initial step. Let's get you the project development number, the parent number. We're, we're talking about the number. Yes, I don't want, I mean, yes, there are things. So people understand more broadly what Kevin and I are talking about. These numbers that DEC requires to spend money, for, to requires for any of us to spend money, have a have this relationship. There's an initial one, and then if there's a subsequent one, it's considered a child. So this is the parent-child thing. I don't know that we need to get into that too much, but what we're doing right now is trying to say, let's make it easier to get a number because under the current system, you need to have a number before you can spend money. And if you don't have a number, if you're doing stuff, we can't we can't spend the money. And we're looking for ways to make it possible to match a number to you, to your organization, more readily. And either we get it in advance and it's generic, or maybe we use this, like, it's not AI, but it's just like crunching together a bunch of different options and that that will make it that much easier to get the number from the Washington panel. And we're not going to be able to solve the problem of needing it at each step. Do you mind if I ask a question? No, go ahead. So am I understanding correctly that there would still be an approval process on a per project basis? It would just be internal to the quiz, like when a partner organization submits an application, what is it just automatically approved? Or how does yeah, that it's basically automatically approved. I mean, the the it's as long, yeah, it's it's the prerequisites for getting the funds would be you're a partner organization and you're doing things consistent with the DEC guidance, which to me means if it's project development, it's got to be consistent with the, the project development. If someone says, I would like to get, you know, write me a task order for um, final design, I'm going to say, well, eh, that's not project development. That's that's what you have to do. So really, if it is project development and, and you know, when getting when getting a number, either one that we are able to get in advance, there will be a description that establishes its project development, or you will get one as a, as a partner organization. Yours is gonna, it's gonna, it's got a place that says it's project development. So it's gonna have to be project development. Now, we will get invoices and we process invoices. And if I see invoices that show someone hired a consultant to do final design, well, that's, that's a problem, but that's 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 whoever submitting that invoice could be kind of rash, because that's not project development. They can't they can't exceed the bounds of project development. So that's all that we're trying to do is to make that project development money, which DEC was saying, hey, get more project development money out there in the hinterlands. That's what we're trying to do. So that project development number, watershed database number is going to be for the geographical scope of that entity. Well, so we're, as far as like, what is gonna crack the code for DEC to give us pre-approved numbers, it's um, it's perhaps gonna be geographic, it's perhaps gonna be uh, the project type, perhaps it's gonna be an intersection of those two. I'm not sure what the answer is specifically, but we're gonna, we're going to go to Karen with some scenarios and say, okay, which one? Would you rather see you know, a separate ID for each municipality or each sub-watershed? Because it could be done like that. Or would you like to see it by project type? Or can we come to some agreement about baskets to put the work in? Because as Dan, Dan in the meeting, my counterpart in the Basin 5, had attended a meeting where he showed on the screen the description that went along with a project development project and it was just so vague that in his mind like hey come on if you've approved these kinds of things before show a little bit of flexibility now yeah. with them and so again this I, I don't know if it's going to be geographic i don't know and it may be an intersection but the idea would be we we write them all up we load them in the and form, and we just say, okay, sign off on them, or sign off on those many of them as you're ready to. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's the goal. That's the goal. And I know that we're taking a bit of time here, but that's that's the first motion. And I'm going to go into the Dean. second one. Dean, oh, sorry. Uh, Barry has had his hand up on uh, the screen. Wait, Barry, Barry's got to leave at 1230, right? Uh, yeah, around 1220. Uh, but uh, my question is, have you run any of this by DEC? We have not. So is this an attempt to force their hand in one way or another? Well, somebody could interpret it that way. We're we're doing what we think is, is allowed. Um, and it may be now DEC's, you know, Karen was at the meeting in Lamoille where the proposal was approved. Um, these these kinds of conversations have a way of filtering through. Um, we haven't, you know, yeah, we haven't um, gone to DEC to seek their approval because we think we're doing what's allowable. Yeah, it, it's just getting the initial project development more like a database number, then yeah, this, this seems like it puts the onus more on you, Dean, or Nathaniel and Megar than me. I can bring in a project development proposal and you guys take it from there with a series of questions that's on my proposal. How does this fit in? Is this AOP related or a confluence of AOP, clean water, other projects? that have an amalgamation or is it stormwater runoff or, you know, I can see a whole host of things that we could be checking off really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, it gives so us broad, I guess it gives us broad uh, and our project development doesn't hamper us to like a single type of project or a single geographic location, because that's the thing with project development is, we're looking at broad geographical scope with a lot of project types. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this tool that I talked about has multiple scales. So, and it has multiple project types and activities. So people could, in theory, if, if we don't, we don't have a, a generic number ready, if someone wants to walk into my office or go online and fill out the form in a month. Um, you could pair, I think, a, a full watershed with a specific type and write it in, describe it in a particular way that should get serious consideration from the watershed planner for project development. What seems to be the project, the watershed planner's biggest concern is, is like um, duplication. That's the big concern that I hear from Karen because she, as the watershed planner, doesn't want to have somebody come to her and say, how could you possibly have approved these two same things? So I think that as part of this, and it's getting off into the weeds a bit, we're going to be looking at what just avoid sameness or avoid exact duplication. I think as soon as you can start to distinguish things, then that starts to put her at ease. So that would mean potentially that you could come in with something that is the Mississippi watershed, the whole basin, as big as the whole basin, and a very specific arcane type. And no one's going to be competing for you to do that kind of work. <laughs> you should get that ID pretty readily, but mm -hmm. it's where those where those conditions are more similar to things that others might be doing is where she seems to be most sensitive. And so this is this tool would say, okay, well, if that's too much like this other, then we have you can choose different subwatersheds and, and differentiate in a way that's gonna make her less concerned about. Right. She, she's probably seeing duplicity in partner water partners like applying for the same project number. Or something. So you got, yeah. I mean, it's group a group of three, three different entities working on the same project in different capacities, but on paper it could look exactly the same. Right. So, and then going back to Barry's point, you know, this is this is something where, um, again, we think that it's allowable, and that DC stance should be more prone to allowing the things that are allowable 
and really focusing on a fewer, smaller number of things that are just the absolutes of things that you can't do. And there's our reading doesn't say that this is a can't do. And so we're making this proposal to the Basin Council, as we have in the memorial, to try to set this up and try to make it work. If it's okay, I'm just gonna go into the second motion so that people know what it says, and then we can consider things further. Because at that point, I should be the one who stops talking. Okay. So the first motion creates a program. The second motion is approving a slate, a menu, or whatever. It's it's doing what in Basin 5, they did in their second meeting, basically. And we're doing it in one. So the motion would say, I move that in furtherance of the prior motion, the board hereby approves the following individual projects. So you're, you're taking um, a step that you haven't taken before, which is to achieve these kinds of goals, you're saying yes to projects that haven't been before you, but since it's meant to achieve the goals that are legitimate, you're going to say yes. So, so there's separate general project development projects by each holder of a master agreement in the amount of $10,000. So you're saying in furtherance of this program, the WIC hereby approves these projects. And so this is, this is essentially meant to protect us all so that someone couldn't come later and say, well, the BWIC never approved individual projects. Well, if the motion is saying that you're approving individual projects, then I think that we're in a pretty good position to say that the BWIC approved individual projects. You're essentially saying I, it's, it is avoiding the creation of a list and saying for each one, but that could be like the extreme version of this is that I hereby approve ten thousand up to ten thousand dollars for friends of Northern Lake Champlain. I hereby approve up to ten thousand dollars. So we're not we're not suggesting that you do that, but we're saying what we think you can do is essentially the same thing, but by describing separate project development projects by each holder of a master agreement. That's essentially what the pre-qualified entities have in the amount. So you're saying pre-approve a project. Um, and you're also saying that the RPC gets one of those up to 10,000 so, because they're not a pre-qualified entity. Um, and then the other thing is, is that it's saying, however, no, nobody is required to do this. It's not a mandate. It's really intended to create the opportunity and then saying, Individual projects are deemed to have been preliminary evaluated by the quiz. So we created this proposal. We think it's it's legitimate, it's valuable, it is affordable in a sense, or in the sense that it's a pretty modest proportion of the allocation that we get to do improve, improvements in the Mrs. Quay Basin. And that so we've determined it worthy. That's what we normally do. You know, when a project is applied for in the normal way, it comes in and we package it up and we give it to the Basin Council and we usually have a recommendation of the staff to approve or we haven't voted to, or we haven't recommended to disapprove, but we're giving it a stamp of approval with our recommendation and that's what we are doing respectively now. So this motion would declare that the individual projects are deemed to have a preliminary evaluated by the QUISP, which I'm telling you is the case, and you consider them worthy of funding by the Basin Council. So the first thing is create the program. The second motion is approve the projects, and that we believe would set the stage for this to move forward. And then I guess if we set it up and we don't, or we're not successful getting ID numbers, then we look on getting ID numbers the conventional way. Conceivable that DEC tries to intervene in some way. I don't know how. So, the, so just to put this into context, the, the fact that the Basin Council adopted a policy that said that budget adjustments can occur, that's essentially the same thing. 
you the, no money can be authorized without the approval of the council. But the council said, hey, in small amounts, we're pre-approving it. We're saying that the staff can approve it up to 10%. So this is very analogous to that. And so if DEC had a problem, and DEC is well aware that we in Quisplan are doing this, so if they didn't have a problem for that, we think that they shouldn't have a problem mm -hmm. with this. Anyway, <clears throat> Lindsay, please let me stop and you run the show. <laughs> Well, I'll just say, Dean, thanks for that. Um, thanks for taking what was sort of a nebulous idea and putting it into a couple of options. And thanks everybody for the the astute questions and the comments that were made. Um, are there more questions for Dean or more discussion about either of those potential options? And then as it says on the screen, possible action. I mean, I think we've all experienced, or at least the folks that have pursued some of these projects have experienced the the bottleneck of getting the project ID and, and you know, sort of that we're building the plane while we fly it. So it's always like, oh, wait, now you need an ID for each and every step, like was mentioned in the room. Um to some degree, we have to adjust to that. And to some degree, maybe DEC needs to adjust to that. And I, I kind of like the idea of uh, having our our QUISP be one of those pushing points of like, hey, will this work? Let's let's see if we can get this be, to be easier. So I appreciate, Dean, you being willing to sort of take that on and, and uh, suggesting that you might be the spearhead for saying, no, let's just have these sort of blanket ID numbers. I, I don't know if it'll work, but I like the idea of pushing towards it. Anyone else have thoughts? Did uh, what you had mentioned, Karen was in the room for the Lamoille meeting. Any uh, any any reaction from her about how this might fly? Well, what I'm remembering is what I was saying before about her. Her feeling is that it's not it's not difficult to get a watershed project ID number. And and I have talked with my my peers in the other basins and uh and for some of them getting the ID number is not an issue, but it it has been an issue for folks that I've worked with in, in the two basins that we covered. So her view is that. It's it's not that difficult or as difficult as maybe some people are saying, and that you know it could be addressed perhaps through better training or uh, another session on the the so-called N form, which is this online form that organizations are using or asked to use to to request a number. Um, so she's she's just coming at it from a different place that it's not as difficult to to get the idea numbers but i mean i i definitely heard at least a couple of the folks there in person that they you know this would help is basically what yeah i have i have an example of of just feeling like i was hitting my head against a brick wall, wall with no time to do that sort of activity um, you know, it, it is fairly simple to get a project ID, but then you get questions that that I feel like I've already answered in the end form and, you know, the clarification that I'm asking for, the end form itself is not, doesn't ask for the right questions, I think, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting questions from Karen saying, oh, well, how is this different than this other project that you have an ID form? And it's sort of like, well, if I'm asking for two different ID forms, they're different projects. Why are you making me jump through these hoops? So I like the idea of not having to have that conversation. It's not that the getting the idea is difficult. It's that sometimes the way I'm communicating is not the same way that Karen expects me to. And um, so I have had that personal experience of it not being difficult to get an ID, but it being just a, an, another step that I don't feel like I have the time to take 
Um, so that's why I'd be pro seeing if we could make this system work. I don't know if you can see them, Lindsay, but there's at least one hand up. I cannot. So yeah, I'll, I'll ask you or Sarah to call on those folks. Yeah. All right. I'm ready to proceed to make a motion, but before I do that, I'd like to review the monetary amounts that you have proposed. Um, I'm my impression, my gut impression is that they are inadequate. Um, and I think it needs to be raised significantly. I think that uh, what I really liked in the second part of the uh, motion was the recognition that uh, there's no obligation to move ahead on the projects because we are, there has been constant change in the first two years of these as far as uh, fee calculations and HAs and what order that we are doing things uh, that um, projects that we started out with really strong process calculations on have plummeted once we get into new calculations. And so I, it's really important that this be recognized. But I would like to kind of, I would like to know again why we are limiting this to only $5,000 yeah, per group. It's, it's my, yeah, just to clarify, um, <coughs> guilty of copy and paste error. Um, the 5,000 number was the number that was, was recommended that the quisp, after talking with Catherine, Catherine and I felt $5,000 per partner organization on an annual basis was what could be supported by their funding allocation in Basin 7. And the Basin allocation in the Missisquoi is two times plus that. So the numbers that are here are not the numbers I'm recommending. My error was, I thought that I had updated them and maybe I copied in the wrong ones, but it's $10,000 for partner organization. They could do it, they could request annually. So this is a program. And so someone signs a task order in 2024, they can come back in 2025 under the same program and get a different number, a different different task order. So that's that's just one point that I want to make. Ten thousand is rather than five thousand, which is what we did in Lamoille. Now your question about should it be a lot higher? I can't I can't say. I know that Catherine is comfortable with ten thousand. I can't tell you what Catherine how much higher a number that Catherine would endorse. But I can tell you, I know she's comfortable at 10,000. And just bear in mind, it also says it's annual. This is a program. So the door would be open to partner organizations to come in and request one of these on an annual basis. So maybe that also helps. Um, and then the other thing I was gonna say is, is that no obligation to move forward with these projects. Um, it, this doesn't mean quite what, you said, Ken, but I think that we get to the same place. This is that line is simply meant to say no partner organization need do this. So there's there's no obligation for them to claim one of these ten thousand dollar projects. There's no pressure to do that. Now, what you've said is that you like this idea that you don't if you do project development that you don't necessarily have to pursue the project. As a quiz, wearing my quiz hat, I would say that, well, I mean, we do want as much as possible the investment to lead towards things that will go to phosphorus reduction. We do want that, but that's that's not covered by this proposal because project development, it's early stage stuff. It could go in any direction. So we recognize that. So no one's no one's going to be kicked out of the program if what happens to you in the future is what happened to you with the one project that I think we're thinking about. So there's nothing like that because project development is considered, it's like too early to know anything about phosphorus reduction. So there's no, there's real no judgment about phosphorus reduction. The hope though is that, I mean, DEC's expectation seems to be that, hey, channel money to project development, and it's going to lead to more projects. We had to get more things in the pipeline. 
well, this is maybe going to get things in the pipeline. I, I also don't believe we're not going to bat a thousand. So, you know, at some point we'll have an experience and we'll say, yeah, we're lucky to bat 500. I just don't know what the, the batting average is going to be to be considered good. But there's no there's no litmus test if a project doesn't survive the project development process. With that understanding, I'd like to go ahead and make this an action item and I'll, I will put it as a motion then uh, with the understanding that we've raised those amounts to 10,000. We do have another question on the screen, I think probably prior to that motion, uh, Lauren. Sorry. Oh, I'm not able to hear you, Lauren, but I can articulate your question, I think. No. Yep. Lauren, jump in if I'm misarticulating. Yeah, are there, um, so Lauren wrote in the chat, are there restrictions on these dollars? And and also, is, is there any sort of, um, you know, we had discussed last meeting about how many projects would need to be used or would need to be um, developed with these dollars? Is there anything like that? Um, so are there any restrictions regarding what time can be spent on, like can we go to public meetings to try to list the project? So, uh, I mean, if I'm channeling Karen, I would say that, you let me think because I think that she's the one. I mean, I, my view of this is that if you're doing something that's consistent with the ID number, and if the ID number is specific, well, then that ties you more than one that's generic. Then, then you're good. And then the next question would be: Is it still considered project development? And you're you want to know if you can go to public meetings to try to solicit projects. It's you. You should have an idea of the type of project in mind. So I think that if and maybe this is a fuzzy, another fuzzy line, which is what I referred to earlier. But if you if you have the belief that a certain type of project is a good idea in a particular location, and you're going to the meeting to get a read on, hey, is this right? Then I think it's project development. If you have no idea, if you're just going, if you set up a meeting and you say, hey, we're so-and-so and we want to do projects and the sky is the limit, I think that's maybe not specific enough. That's that's not, yeah, you need to have a project concept of some sort to be developing. But on the other hand, I would say that, you know, if you can tie that meeting to some, this is where the parents come in. If you can tie it to some previous body of work that said, hey, go meet with the people in town X to talk about something. And that, that assessment, that parent document considered that a project, then I think you could go call a meeting to talk about that stuff. I don't know if that happens. And as far as your question, Barry, I think we're okay with with quorum if you have to go or when you have to go. I think we're okay. So Kent did make a motion. Or I did. Yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. Was there a second? I'll second. Sarah, there's a follow up. You should, right. Do you want to go first? And, or did someone, is it, is it Lauren's question that is the next one up? Yeah. yeah. So, can we get a couple of meetings we talked about? And is there a number of projects required to come out of each year? Um, it's not a, I mean, the way I look at this is it's not a, a required number of projects coming out of this award each year. It's, it is, a desired number of projects that come out of each task award. Because if you get money 
in one year, it may carry over into a second year. And so ideally there's at least one, but there's not a, you know, as we all know, or many of us know, sometimes the result of the project development work is that it just isn't viable. So you might, you might have found that a project isn't viable. Now, we haven't said anything about cost effectiveness in this. Just my personal bias would be to do project development work. It would be maybe a desirable rule of thumb of $5,000 per project. So to me, just instinctively, if two projects came out of $10,000, that would be pretty good. That's just my gut reaction, but it isn't embodied in the motion. And there's nothing in the text that says that you would be forced to achieve that. Well, and you've already negated it by motion too, that there's nothing to say that you can have this go on and then everything falls apart and you don't have anything at the end. So you're not obligated to bring a project forward. Well, as I was saying in response to Ken's comment, that language just means that no one is required to go into this program. So the words on that are being misinterpreted as, as though they say, hey, you can spend the money and not care. That's no, not what it no, says. It's saying you don't have to take advantage of this. You can just limit yourself to the normal application process. You don't have to jump into this if you feel there's something about it that's too risky. Or if it's not enough money. If someone said, hey, I have a project development activity and really the only way to approach this is gonna cost me at least $20,000 because you need some highly specialized ecological assessment and wetlands delineation and some arcane cultural resource assessment, and you do all of them, and it's going to cost you $20,000. That may be you just, okay, go the route of the normal process. You have a motion and you have a second. And are there, yeah. Yep. And the motion, just for clarification, was it's as it was written, but with the $10,000 figures and the basin six, not basin seven. Is that understood? Okay. Yes, thanks for that clarification. We have a mo motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? Okay, uh, we'll seek a vote then. All in favor, please express. Um, folks on screen, just use your hand function or raise your hand. I've got Lindsay, Lauren, Beth, and then folks in the physical room. Um, we have Dan, Tucker, Sarah, Ken, and Ed. Okay. Motion passes. Good luck. Hey, Lindsay, I, I just talked something in the chat, but when, when would this start and like, when is the year? Is it the fiscal year? Like, when does this turn on? So it's going to turn on as quickly as possible. I think realistically, it's going to be something like the week after Labor Day. Realistically, not before then. All right. And then as far as um, it, it could be um, one year from the date of the first request. So so that's yeah the, the if if you're wondering like when could you come in for your second well i'm looking at 12 months from the first one. does that help yeah that's a good clarification so you get one per 12 month cycle but that doesn't limit additional project development requests from an organization yeah. correct <laughs> Uh, so, sorry, what was that again? From Lauren, she asked, it doesn't limit additional project development requests from an organization. Um, right, right. I mean, people can, yes, they're, this isn't displacing the normal process. So there will still be another round coming up and these things are gonna be, you know, essentially in the same time frame. And maybe that's what will end up happening is, is that 
they'll go online together. But I don't think that it's going to be possible. It's going to be there's going to be another round opening up. I think maybe, like it's very soon. It's like in a week according to the initial schedule. So around the time that the next regular round ends, this new program will be online. So so if someone doesn't want to apply in this next round that's in August, September, and you don't want to do this program, which will be starting somewhat, you know, roughly middle of September, then the ne next opportunity is like November, December. I'm not remembering, but we have it somewhere. Okay. Um, I think we'll move on to discussing State of the Lake. Yeah. Oh, so, oh. Uh, well, I'm just the. So, State of the Lake. Okay. So, if we're talking about the State of the Lake, um, I just thought people would find it interesting to, uh, if they weren't aware of it, to be aware of the State of the Lake report, which gets updated every few years. Um, and I thought it would also be interesting to pull out some of the factoids um, that relate to either the Missisquoi River or Missisquoi Bay, which are where the rivers that we cover flow into. Here's the link which if you have the packet, you can click the link. It isn't necessarily easy to find the PDF document. The PDF document works for me. If you go to the website, the first thing you'll see is something called a story map. And that's also a different way to review. Um, but it's, um, you know, we're, we're doing this work. This work is being funded because of the need to lower phosphorus and it's, not getting any less important. Um, there are some encouraging signs across the whole basin. Some places in, in the basin, of course, includes Vermont and New York and part of Quebec. So there are some New York lakes that have seen some improvement. Um, in our area, the pipe has shown some notable improvement. Um, so that's a that's a plus, you know, pat ourselves in the back. Some things more specific to the Missisquoi and the pike. And I didn't, I looked for, but didn't see anything specific to the Rock River in um, this particular iteration of the State of the Lake report. So uh, maybe things that, maybe that tells you something, maybe it doesn't. But um, the bullet point, since I'm kind of running low on something here, even though phosphorus concentrations in the day show a downward trend. Phosphorus loading, so the amount of phosphorus coming in has been relatively higher in the past. So something is at work. The basin, the the bay itself, gotten in a little bit better, but still we're not turning off the spigot as much as maybe we should. Um, but in the pike, things have gotten better. So go figure. Um, I'm not an expert on this by any means. Um, but, you know, even though there's this phosphorus measure in the bay, frequent cyanobacteria blooms because, relatively speaking, the nutrients are still high. Um, you know, maybe this is coming from legacy, although certainly coming from legacy phosphorus as well. Um, yeah, so concentration's going down, still way too high. That's pretty much the upshot. I'm not going to try to say anything more about it because I'm not that guy. Um, or expert, but if people wanted to, I would encourage you to check. Out. I would encourage you to check out the um, the report. I'm just trying to get back. Okay, so in terms of the schedule, answering the question earlier, so we have the next round, which was scheduled opening up next week. The deadline is the 17th, and the next one would be just before um, Christmas, December 18th. That would be the next regular round. These are in addition to the program that we were just talking about. Any Anything else 
Lindsay, that you would like to talk about? I think that's good for me. Um, I think it's on your radar to talk about public participation, right? Oh, and Lauren's got her hand up. Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah. I just wanted to share with folks in the room, if you're available tonight, there'll be a Montgomery Flood Resilience Meeting at 530 at the public town offices. Really love to have a bunch of folks there. Um, and then I also tossed in the chat and invite for a week from today at the Hardak um, Recreation Area at their Greg Brown Lodge. We're hosting a local-led dinner to try to gather some information to influence funding at the federal level, um, as well as talk about a possible food forest um, around the dog park at Hardak. So it'll be a fun one. There'll be dinner. Um, so we'd just love to, love to see folks there. Um, there's also going to be a bike along the Black Creek coming up. Um, and I'll toss a couple of links in the chat. But lots of fun stuff if you're interested in getting out there and doing that. Thanks, Lauren. So, uh, Any other words have similar things they want to share? Well, you did mention something I had I had intended to bring up. So thank you, Lindsay. Um, and that topic is the public participation issue, public participation policy, public participation plan. Um, we had gotten close. I had gotten close to including it as an agenda item for a presentation. Uh, and, and Barry, it's too bad he's dropped off, but he's aware of this too, because he's been part of some internal discussions at the Regional Planning Commission. So very quickly, I'm just gonna say, when the Basin Council was created, one of the things that it had to do and that the Basin, that the Quisp had to do was adopt a public participation policy. The way that we cracked that nut was to adopt something pretty simple. And it was called an interim policy. And the goal was to revisit it and come back with a permanent policy within a year's time or something like that. There was a subcommittee created. Uh, I'm not remembering all of the members. I think Ellen, Lauren, Barry, and there were one or two other people, maybe Alaire. Um, and that committee set about to take the policy to a permanent status. Well, unfortunately, that work um, it was done, it was helpful, but the response or a response that came from the Regional Planning Commission or Catherine wearing her Regional Planning Commission hat was that before the Basin Council should adopt a final public participation policy, then maybe it would benefit or it would benefit from work that the Regional Planning Commission was doing on a public participation plan. I'm hoping everybody's will still because it gets a little bit, a little bit arcane. So the regional planning, so the so the Basin Council said, okay, we'll put things on hold while the Regional Planning Commission works on a public participation plan. And originally that public participation plan was expected last December. And so we had been thinking that there would be material that be brought to the council so we'd say hey council you can re resume your work on a on a policy a, a permanent policy because the regional plan planning commission's public participation plan is done and it can help you so what i had i have to admit or inform you is that the whole timeline got extended and i thought that we were at a point at the regional planning commission two or three weeks ago that would say, oh, the plan, it's gonna go prime time. And you can start looking at it and contribute to it and that we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. What I learned just before this agenda was ready that the Regional Planning Commission, in part because of some new things in the law, has, it's, it's holding the, the public participation plan and is gonna to continue to do more work on it and maybe ramping up the public involvement in the creation of the public participation plan, which some people might say, well, why wasn't that always the plan? I don't know, but I can tell you at least that it's probably gonna be the plan now. And so instead of saying, 
here's the agenda item, here's the plan, and get the committee starting again. There was no agenda item, and it's an update. It's an update to let you know that the Regional Planning Commission's public participation plan still isn't done yet, but stay tuned because news should be coming in the next couple of few weeks, month. Anyway, it's kind of a big year indulgence situation on my part. Anyway, that's all that I needed to say about that and more. Lauren has a question. I'm just going to keep beating this drum as long as I can and say we need more project implementers. Therefore, we need a project or public participation plan and we need training from DEC and the quest. And I'll get off my horse. Great. I think um, on that inspirational and necessary note, <laughs> we've we've concluded all of our business. Hey, Lindsay, David had a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah, I was just wondering how many projects we've funded so far. Just how many? To see how successful we're actually being. So, Dave, I think I heard you ask how many projects have been implemented so far, completed? Yep. Nope. Well, projects have been completed, but they are not implementation projects yet. We've had at least, we have at least one major implementation project that is still, you know, in its getting ready phases. I'm, I'm looking up, trying to picture in my mind's eye what the current status of all the projects is. Um, and I can grab that spreadsheet if you wanted to get like a detailed breakdown, but as far as getting projects that are directly reducing phosphorus as of today, none that I'm thinking of. If someone's got a better memory than I do. Well, how many are we funding right now? Um, it's about a it's about a dozen, I think. Okay. All right. I have a spreadsheet that I can send you, Dave, or that I'm moving towards getting it as an additional thing on our website, not there yet, but I have a spreadsheet that has been updated as part of this annual um, financial stuff that we have for DEC. So it is up to date now and I can get that, I can get that to you. Okay, I was just curious how many projects we have in the works right now. Thank you. And then Lauren asks update on O&M. Um, there are training modules available or viewing, um, Lauren says, just trying to figure out if we're adopting past tree planting specifically. Uh, what was the last bit of what you said? Have they, so yes, they are doing training, but have they have they announced more training? No, I say, <laughs> are we able to adopt past tree plantings for O&M work? Okay, so yeah, so O&M is one, um, we haven't talked about O and M. It would be a very strong candidate for conversation at the next meeting, and um, yeah, we're, um, Nathaniel and I spent an hour meeting yesterday talking about some of the intricacies of O and M. But if there are projects that any of you, any partner organizations, see as candidates, then please start the conversation with us about how we can make that happen. That will require an action. I, I believe there's, there's gonna need to be an action of the Basin Council to adopt projects, but the process, I, I, someone from DVC that we work with a lot has said, you know, something to the effect that the Basin Councils could spend the next year or a year and a half just talking about O&M. And I don't think he's too far off. We could end up speaking a lot about it. I just, um, have not gotten the impression since the last time we talked about it that people had a lot of potential adopt adopted projects. But if they're starting to be identified, then please, please yeah, have a conversation with me about it. Yes, there are a couple, especially up in the this upper Nisiskoy where we had trees for streams projects okay. going on. And those lands have undergone a series of landowner 
transitions and for the better is that what you thought worse <laughs> yeah uh but there no one's taking care of those because you know we need to remind the new landowners that the previous owner had signed the o m on this so there's going to be some follow-up but there's also tree mortality that is associated with long term and yeah and so this is this is where some of the things get intricate because you know there's this training as, as lauren had mentioned and the training is focused on getting verifiers people identified who can verify the can the, the status of a of a project essentially and before we as a quiz and a and the, with your action by the quick before we can adopt then we would need to verify the status of that project. And so this is giving me really, it's giving me flashbacks for what happened in Vermont with stormwater permits and this whole uh, move towards adopting permits and, and who would adopt them and who's going to pay for bringing the project up to snuff if it wasn't up to snuff. Um, so anyway, let's let's start to have specific conversations. If you have ideas for projects, so that we can start um, trying to figure out, you know, what is their what is their path to adoption? And yes, the again, the incentive for adoption is to be able to claim the phosphorus reduction for them. Great, sounds like a great topic for next meeting, or one-on-one -on -one conversations with Dean. Any last statements, questions, concerns, announcements? All right. Thanks for everyone's fortitude. Thanks, Dean, for doing the majority of the work, as ever, <laughs> and the majority of the uh, running of the meeting. Um, so we want a motion to adjourn. I move the adjourn. I've got a motion from Sarah. Is there a second? Second. Sure. Second from Beth. All right. All in favor? Please indicate if you're on screen. I'm on screen. I've got Lindsay, Boren, Beth. Looks like Dan, there's me in the back. Upper and Sarah and Ken. She's ahead. So yeah. All right. Well, thanks for running a good annual meeting. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to spend the last few minutes talking to the folks in the room, but um, appreciate everyone's work this year on our Basin Water Quality Council. And I am um, I'm pleased to be a part of this Basin Water Quality Council. I, I don't have exposure to other ones, but I know that you're all a great group of people to meet with every, every other month. So thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Thank you.